you. So, Dr. Dr. Nick Pavlakis is the head of the Department of Medical Oncology at Royal North Shore Hospital and Associate Professor of um, the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Sydney. Um, he's also visiting medical... Uh, the Marta... Mm, do you know, Nick, I'm going to have to get you to pronounce that, at a hospital in North Sydney, um, Royal North Shore Hospital and Armadale Oncology Clinic. He's been on staff at the Department of Medical Oncology at Royal North Shore Hospital since 2001 and been the head of department and head of clinical trials unit since 2007. He's worked in private oncology since 1998, but he's also an academic medical oncologist, having published numerous journal manuscripts and is conducting um, ongoing research and teaching activities. Nick's clinical interest is in lung cancers, mesothelioma, colorectal cancer and other gastrointestinal cancers including discs and nets and renal cell cancer. His clinical research focuses on trials in these tumour types and includes new cancer drug development, especially in the area of anti-angiogenesis drugs. So Nick, thank you so much for um, joining with us this evening. Um, I'll, um, without further ado, allow you to take the stand and just... For anyone who has joined us um, in the last little while, we're just asking any participants to please mute their telephones and that just helps us reduce background noise. The way that you mute your phone is to press the star and then the six on your telephone keypad. And thanks to everyone who's done that, I can, I can tell that most people have indeed um, muted their phones. So thanks so much. The star and then the six. So thanks, um, thanks so much, Nick. I'll, um, I'll hand over to you. And Nick, I can't hear you. Do you want to just try that again? Can you hear me now? I can. Right, I unmuted my phone. Oh. Um. <laughs> you, were, you were extra obedient. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. So thank you for this opportunity. And I'll try to build on uh, the, the introduction and the talk that um, Rod has given without trying to uh, overlap where I, where I can avoid it. Um, so Rod has already indicated uh, uh, some of the nomenclature that we use for this disease and our understanding that has developed over the years. Carthenoid tumours, which we now uh, refer to uh, those uh, tumours arising from the small uh, bowel primarily, had been first discovered many years ago at the turn of the century. And it was the carthenoid syndrome that led us to the understanding of the production of hormones associated with these tumours and the syndrome per se is related to hormones that can re result, uh, which are called vasoactive hormones that can affect blood vasculature resulting in flushing, wheezing and diarrhoea. Um, some of the other words that um, uh, we'll be referring to in this talk and have been mentioned already by Rod, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumours, that's a mouthful reference to those now as the classification systems have adopted a, a greater a, a control in terms of isolating the types of tumours um, and where they have originated in the body. The classification systems um, that I'll be referring to primarily uh, we use is the World Health Organization and the European Neuroendocrine Society which is ENET. Now basically um, we tend to think of uh, these tumours and bag them into a well-differentiated, which is either low or intermediate grade category, and a high grade category. And that case description that Rod had at the end in part uh, uh, um, explains these. Low grade tumours tend to behave in a more consistent fashion, tend to grow more slowly, are often found late because of the their nature and that they lack symptoms in the beginning and therefore may have spread, but equally once found can exist for quite a long time um, um, and before they cause problems. So hence, um, we think of low-grade tumours as a chronic disease. High-grade tumours, however, are much more uh, cancer-like, often pro 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 uh, progress very quickly and require chemotherapy and radiotherapy for control. Um, one of the things that's important when a diagnosis is made and trying to distinguish between low-grade and high-grade tumours is looking at the tumours under the microscope and looking at how, how many cells seem to be multiplying. We refer to this as mitotic count 
and we use an index called KI67 uh, and the proportion of cells that are found uh, by percentage uh, allow us to separate tumors between low grade, grade one, intermediate two, and high grade, grade three. The next thing when we refer to these uh, the neuroendocrine tumors is to think of them as either non-functioning tumors or functioning tumors. And non-functioning tumors don't have secretory symptoms such as the carcinoid syndrome uh, or equivalent. Functioning tumors have secretory symptoms resulting from the hormones that are produced. And the carcinoid syndrome is one example, but depending on the types of uh, chemicals produced, for example, if you have gastrin secreted, you'll get ulcer-like symptoms. If you have glucagon secreted, you'll get high blood sugars. If you have insulin secreted, you get low blood sugars. And these are rarer uh, syndromes, but ones that we nonetheless are, are aware of according to the hormones produced. Carcinoid syndrome, I've indicated to you, occurs in up to 20% of cases associated with small bowel uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and very commonly, especially if there are liver metastases. And it's due to these hormones that are, we call bioactive substances characterized by diarrhea, flushing, wheeze, and if a patient is unaware of these symptoms, can, can lead to right heart failure as well. I have to say that I haven't seen this very commonly in the clinic uh, anymore, partly to do with the widespread use of the somatostatin drugs that uh, Rod had indicated in his talk. I'll go over this because we've already heard that uh, the incidence is rising um, globally um, and has increased particularly since the 1970s. Um, now, this slide summarizes the proportion of uh, endocrine tumors uh, uh, arising from the body uh, and in the most common sites. We used to think of them as mid-gut, foregut, and hindgut. As you can see here, um, respiratory still makes up a large proportion. The gut as a whole makes up a large proportion. Pancreas, for which there's been a lot of research in recent years, makes up a relatively small proportion. Now, most, cancer, most neuroendocrine tumors occur out of the blue. We refer to that as sporadic cancers, um, but rarely they can be associated with some specific familial uh, syndromes. <clears throat> and how they present depends on which part of the body they originated from, whether they contain uh, hormones and therefore produce uh, uh, syndromes associated with that. Most uh, functioning tumors um, are often discovered when they're quite small, and it's actually the hormones that lead to their discovery because of search to try to identify the syndromes. But the delaying diagnosis is typical um, and, and often years after the onset. And just to consolidate and use the same slide that Rod had used, um, this is, is one of the reasons why um, it, the, the, there is often a delay in diagnosis, and that is many of the symptoms can be fairly non-specific initially, and to a general practitioner can be attributable to more uh, common other causes before um, uh, searching for things such as uh, carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumors. So when a tumor is suspected, the principle is first to try to obtain a biopsy to determine the type of tumor it is and look at the grading. And then the, the next thing to do is to look at the extent of the disease, which we call the stage. And with this information, we can then look at treatment planning and follow-up. <clears throat> when we stage a cancer, we think of the size of the primary tumor, if we know where it is, the number of lymph nodes involved adjacent to the primary tumor, and whether there are metastases or not. And generally, a cancer's a neuroendocrine tumor would be considered early, if, it has a, if it's small, has local lymph nodes and can be cut out or advanced. If it's a large tumor, has a large number of lymph nodes or is spread to other organs. Common tests uh, uh, used uh, can be quite wide and varied, and some patients may investigations before a diagnosis is made, largely because the tumors may be quite small and undetectable. Um, and sometimes the diagnosis is made serendipitously where uh, a tumor may cause obstruction of the bowel leading to surgery and the finding of a neuroendocrine tumor is found. 
but gallium dotatate PET is more widely used now, and I use it commonly for staging of the disease, as well as using biochemical markers and CT scanning. Um, and in terms of the blood test, the most commonly used tumor marker you'll have referred to, we call chromogranin A or CGA. Uh, this seems to be the most uh, uh, accurate of the markers that we have. There are some situations where you can see false elevations and these uh, in some other types of cancers, but also with the use of anti-ulcer therapies, such as the ones listed. Um, of the other biochemical markers, you could look for serotonin, and you can measure serotonin byproducts in the urine, uh, <clears throat> the 24-hour urine for 5-HIAA, and this is commonly given, uh, undertaken in patients who were worried about the carcinoid syndrome. Uh, but serotonin is produced in many foods, as listed here. So if uh, you are to do uh, investigations looking for these, you'd want to keep these sort of food products on the low side prior to doing the test. So in terms of management, uh, neuroendocrine tumors are truly a disease which require multidisciplinary team management because at any time in a patient's uh, a history with the illness, we may involve a surgeon, we may involve an interventional radiologist looking at liver-targeted therapy, uh, a physician-oncologist looking at chemotherapy, a nuclear medicine physician looking at radiopeptide therapy, and an oncologist looking at drug therapy, uh, targeted therapies. Who steers the patient often is dictated by where the patient is at the time point in their illness and which part of their disease is causing most of their problem. So for example, uh, I have a number of patients with liver predominant disease as the liver is the, is the first organ in which the blood supply of the gut goes to. It's commonly the organ the most affected. Um, and in that case, we discussed a lot of our cases in our liver multidisciplinary team to discuss liver-targeted approaches. Now we'll move on to drug therapy of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, here you'll see a um, uh, slide summarizing very briefly the types of chemotherapy agents that have been used. By and large, we don't use chemotherapy a lot in this disease, largely because of uncertainty over uh, the magnitude of benefit um, and, the, and because of the quality of the early clinical studies that were undertaken. Historically, we use the somatostatin analogs to control the syndrome, but more recently we know that they can delay tumor growth and we use it more widespread. This somewhat busy slide summarizes the pathways of thinking that we would go through in how we would look at trying to uh, get rid of uh, the liver metastases in some patients, particularly those patients where on their scanning, this is the only part of the body affected. Um, and we may use surgery. We may look at uh, TAPE, which is transarterial chemobilization. We may look at um, biologic therapies and also PRT. So the, in terms of um, biotherapy, the somatostatin analogs have been around for a long time. As I said, historically, they were used to control the symptoms, but now we know there's evidence, particularly for somatostatin LAR30, in delaying tumor growth. Side effects from these drugs are very mild and very easily managed, and I've only seen one patient have gallstones that needed surgery in the last 10 years. One of the other symptoms of this disease that requires attention and is often under-appreciated under, uh, is that of fatty poo or steatorrhea, particularly for patients whose pancreas is affected and the pancreas is non-functioning. This can be uh, uh, fixed using pancreatic enzyme supplements and antidiarrheals, and patients need to be uh, evaluated for vitamin D deficiency and also have replacement for uh, fat-soluble vitamins. So uh, more recently, with regard to the somatostanol analogs, there was a clinical trial reported approximately uh, three years ago that demonstrated that the use of these agents, particularly in, in, in uh, mid-gut tumors, can delay tumor growth. Um, the interest in drug development has, uh, was springboarded from this particular trial, and subsequently there have been a number of randomized trials that have enabled us to appreciate more carefully uh, the overall value of the medical treatments for this disease, 
but unfortunately we still lack high level evidence for a number of the treatments that we do and therefore we don't know the relative benefits of some of the treatments compared to others. So I'll go over some of the information here in the coming slides and I'll just point, the, I'll, I'll, I'll direct you to the key points so that you understand uh, what uh, information I'm trying to convey. This trial was the PROMIT style. It was a pivotal trial uh, published uh, three years ago and it gave um, patients a sandostatin LAR30 when they weren't necessarily functioning uh, with their neuroendocrine tumors or placebo. And what was found was a 66% reduction in the rate of growth of the tumor over the treatment period, which is quite a substantial result by any treatment standards in any, treat in any cancer treatment situation. The side effects observed were very mild, and the quality of life was well balanced between these trials. Um, this greater understanding has uh, led to another trial of the somatulin autogel, of which some patients may be receiving instead of standard LAR, and there's a clinical trial with this agent as well to try to confirm the same findings. The next big area of drugs I'll focus on is targeted drugs, and dr these are drugs that focus on tumour pathways such as mTOR and blood vessels such as angiogenesis. A lot of these drugs have been already uh, in the clinic in other diseases such as kidney cancer. And for me personally, as I treat both kidney cancer and endocrine tumors, there's a large degree of overlap with some of the therapies. Um, this is a clinical trial program for the Radiant program, which is three, a series of large clinical trials undertaken with the use of Everolimus, which was previously known as RAD001 in neuroendocrine tumors. The first trial reported was this one, which uh, took patients who had advanced neuroendocrine tumors but who had secretory symptoms, um, and they had to have been progressing within the last 12 months, and they were randomized to receive sandostatin LAR30 or sandostatin LAR30 and everolimus. And the main outcome was, of the study was to see if the tumor growth could be delayed. I just wanted to, this table is just to demonstrate to you the types of patients treated. And you can see here about 50% of patients in the combination arm had had some form of prior treatment. And about 80% of patients had received somatostatin analogs before. The important finding in this trial was the addition of both the drugs together seemed to be better than giving sandostatin alone with a further reduction in tumor growth delay by about 23%. Um, the Everolimus is known to be associated with some side effects, and these are in the circle, the red circle I've highlighted there, fatigue, gum disturbance, diarrhea, a small risk of infections and high blood sugars, but the rate of serious side effects, which we call grade three or four, is less than about 6%. High blood sugars. In, in this study also, where it was measured, chromogranin A and the urine secretion of 5-HIAA was reduced, as the arrows are indicating, across the treatment over the months the patients were receiving the drug. The next study I'll just briefly go over is that of sunitinib. Um, sunitinib is a drug that's been around for about five years for kidney cancer. It attacks blood vessel growth in tumors. And this was a study that looked at well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, a very small group of neuroendocrine uh, tumors. And it gave people a lo somewhat low do lower dose of sunitinib than we give in kidney cancer continuously or placebo. And again, in this trial, I want to show you that those patients that went on this trial had um, received other therapies. 80% had had liver metastases and around 60% had had prior drug therapy such as chemotherapy. And the reason for this is because at this, even up until today, we can access many chemotherapy agents, but accessing these drugs is still limited due to their high costs. But the important finding in this trial, that was almost a 60% delay in tumor growth. And 50% of patients who were receiving the drug had remained very stable with their disease for approximately 12 months and 50% longer than that. There were more side effects, such as diarrhea, nausea, fatigue, and vomiting, uh, and a slightly higher incidence of more serious side effects with the drug. So it's not quite as easy to deliver as Everolimus, but it's very 
patient dependent and some patients may find this easier than other drugs. Sorry, Nick, it's Kate Wakeland from the Cancer Council of Victoria. I'm just um, just letting you know that we'll, um, we're just at about at the end of your time. So maybe um, I, I know you've got a little bit more to cover, but um, perhaps just the, the, um, the main points from here. That'd be great. Thank you. There's not much left to go, Kate. So this last slide was actually looking at everolimus in uh, peanuts, which showed a 66% delay in tumour growth in peanuts with this drug. So what we've learned, uh, it can be summarised on this slide, in that in, in, in certain specific situations, which I've highlighted in blue, you can see that the use of a variety of agents, with, particularly with these targeted agents, has been shown to delay tumour growth. And the concept of delaying tumour growth while maintaining quality of life is what we're trying to achieve in turning this sort of disease into a chronic illness. This slide summarises what treatments are available today, but as of the targeted drugs at the present time, their access is limited, largely due to cost and, la uh, cost and lack of funding, but they are under evaluation for funding. So finally, I'm going to finish up by basically saying that neuroendocrine tumours are a broad mix of tumours, often silent and picked up late. They require multidisciplinary team assessment, and there's a variety of treatments that can be given, if, or within a particular patient, at various time points in their illness. The question is determining which treatment is best for a given patient at a given time of their illness. And what is good for one person at one time may be different for another. And I want to finish up by just highlighting this uh, here. Uh, for, for, uh, um, it's a study that we're undertaking. We're one of a number of centres in Australia to, uh, doing this study, and it's, uh, for, it's getting, giving access to patients to Everolimus, uh, uh, plus or minus pazireotide. And uh, this is the nurse I've indicated there can answer questions and direct anyone who's interested in finding out who's doing this around Australia. So that's it. Oh, look, thank you so much, Nick. And I, um, look, I really do appreciate your time in, um, in presenting this um, very complex information tonight, but you've presented it in a way that um, uh, has been understandable. So thank you. I really do appreciate that. And um, I, I did notice a question from, um, from uh, Kim McLean just a, a moment ago about 5 1, uh, 5H. 1AA. So what we'll try and do is um, perhaps defer, defer that to our um, question time at the end. So, but thank you so much, Nick, and I'm sure that everyone will join me in, um, in expressing our appreciation for your time this evening. Um,